Good evening, Parkway. It's good to see y'all tonight. We've got several people who are uh, facing sickness tonight, but we're glad you all are here, and we are excited about our study tonight uh, in spiritual warfare, fighting the good fight. How many of y'all have been fighting the good fight this week? All right, and the rest of us need to catch up. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Hey, let me just say that uh, we're so pleased to have everybody who's joining us on the live stream, YouTube Live, Facebook Live, via the conference line. Let's welcome all of those folks tonight. <laughs> Amen. It's good to have you all joining us tonight. And it's good to have everybody who's here tonight. Why don't you welcome yourself tonight? Amen. And uh, Brother Joe's going to be coming here shortly, and he'll be sharing from the Word tonight. And I'm looking forward to that with eager anticipation, aren't you? Amen. And we're so glad to have Erica here facilitating our tech tonight. Let's w say thank you to Erica. Let's say thank you to Robbie for set up. Amen. And it's so good to have Andrew back. We, we're so glad to have you back, Andrew work in security, and we're so glad that each and every one of you are here, and each and every one's joining us via the live stream. We're so excited about this study that's getting ready to start here in just a moment, but at first, let me just uh, share a couple things with you. We've got a few people, as I said, who uh, are facing physical challenges tonight. Uh, Donna Husky is not feeling well, and... Uh, Denise had to miss work today as well. She wasn't feeling well. Um, I know that uh, there's several other families as well. The Malamacy family, Anthony, uh, has been struggling. And so we need to lift them up in prayer as well. And uh, how many of you all have a, a loved one or yourself who would need prayer tonight? Amen. Amen. That's, that's good because... That's an opportunity for God to show himself mighty and faithful. Amen? Amen. So uh, we're going to pray here in just a moment. Uh, before uh, I pray, though, let me just say that we've got a new shipment of books in over at the table. And if you need a book, just raise your hand or let Robbie know, and he'll fix you right up with a book tonight. And we've also got uh, the highlighters on the tables. If you need any extra highlighters, if you don't have enough, just let Robbie know as well, and he'll fix you right up with a highlighter as well. We're excited to have our Bibles and our, our workbooks and our notepads and get ready to take notes and highlight things in the book. Uh, this is a, a fascinating study, an in-depth study, and this is going to be, I believe, life-changing and transforming for all of us. Amen. All right. Well, before we ask God for anything, though, Let's thank him. Amen. Can we just stand to our feet now that we're all comfortable? <laughs> and let's just stand and let's just thank him for all of his goodness and mercy and love and all of his grace. Amen. Father, we just thank you tonight. You are good and your mercy endures forever. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done and all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. Thank you for who you are. Thank you most of all for sending your son Jesus to be our Savior. And we put our faith and trust and hope in Jesus tonight. Hallelujah. And Father, we just thank you for the body of Christ who is here tonight in person and remotely. Father, we thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for everyone who is involved in helping to facilitate this session tonight. Father, we just lift this session up to you. And Father, we just say, have your way. Have your way in the midst of your church have your way in the midst of your people. Father, change and transform us by the living word of God. Father, put your hand upon Brother Joe tonight and use him for your glory and for your honor. Father, help him to share the word of God tonight from his heart. And Father, we just lift up all of these who are, are in need of a physical touch tonight. Father, we lift up Donna Husky. We lift up Anthony Malamacy. Lord, we lift up everybody who, who needs a touch tonight. And Father, we just say to everybody who needs a physical healing, we just speak in faith and we just say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And Father, 
We just trust you to, to take care of every problem that we're facing tonight because, Father, you are the way maker. Hallelujah. You are the problem solver, and nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too hard for you. Father, we just ask especially tonight that we would learn how to be equipped, Father, to be the mighty warriors of the faith that you've called us to be. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, you may be seated. God bless you. Come right on, Brother Joe, and share with us from the Word of God tonight. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. It is a joy to be with you again tonight and to continue our study on the good fight. Uh, before we get started, let me bring your attention to 1938, 39 through 1945. Most of us that are a little bit older know that those are the years that World War II was in uh, high gear. Now, my dad actually fought in World War II, came home alive, which was a good thing for me. Um, and something about World War II that most people don't realize, they just think it was a madman trying to take over the world. Well, that's part of it. But if you know anything about the history of the Nazi regime, you'll know very quickly that a lot more behind the scenes was going on in that war. I've actually read some of the transcripts uh, that took place during the war. I've read about Hitler's speeches and how he would mesmerize the crowds, how they would literally almost become glassy-eyed and just be overwhelmed by his orator or oratorical skills or abilities. And I'm not even sure if they were really that great. I've, I've watched some of his speeches. What was more fascinating was his speech writers. Uh, According to Mr. Shearer, who was a correspondent with the BBC during World War II and was actually there chronicling the war in the early years before he got out, uh, he actually documented Hitler's speech writers. And while they would begin to put pen to paper, they would literally go into a trance and their hands would automatically begin to write. All documented. They would have no clue what they were writing. And they would write speeches for him that he would get up and give to probably tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who were just goo-goo-eyed over his incredible skills, or so they thought. We know now that the uh, Nazi regime was very much filled with darkness. You couldn't not be and do the things that Adolf Hitler did. Uh, the, the extermination of six million of God's chosen people. And think of this, if you will. In Germany, the place of the Reformation, Martin Luther, back to the Bible. Uh, you know, the, the cradle, if you will, of Christianity in that time here are exterminating by the millions God's people. And uh, anybody who has a hard time believing in the devil uh, just needs to read a little bit about history. And by the way, Hitler wasn't the only one. If you go back through all the madmen of, of history, you'll see there was a cultic activity and so forth in their administrations, if you will. So I share that with you because I want to start tonight as we get back into our study by saying we are living in a moment, especially in a, a modern-day, technologically savage world like, like we are. We're, we, we think we're so smart and know so much and we're so advanced that the devil has become almost a comic book character. It's something of medieval folklore. It's something that people don't believe anymore. It's something that uh, people put a Halloween costume on with, with um, you know, a tail and a pitchfork and some horns, and we call him the devil. And we laugh at it, and we make fun of it. How many movies have we seen? Which I'm one, I just can't even watch these demonic movies. I, I made the mistake many, many years ago when I was in the military we were in Puerto Rico, and we were out on the ocean one night, and our, our theater was outside, outdoors, and they were showing The Exorcist. So I, I'm not even sure if I was a Christian then. I don't believe I was saved yet, but it was very close to getting saved. That movie may have helped me come to Christ. I'm not sure. But I remember watching The Exorcist, and uh, in, in the middle of one of the demonic scenes when Regan is, her head is spinning, and she's spewing pea green soup or whatever it is she's doing, one of the four by eight sheets of plywood 
that was on our theater. We, you know, it was all plywood, all painted white, and that was our screen. Literally blew off uh, in the heightened wind that was picking up off the ocean out there in the Caribbean. Blew off and landed in the middle of about, I don't know, 250 strapping young Seabees who you would have thought they went screaming for mama. I mean, it was, it was the most unbelievable sight, but it was absolutely frightening, frightening. But today, we don't believe in the devil anymore, or most people don't. And shockingly, I believe if I heard right, and I hate to misquote, but I believe somewhere in the vicinity of 40 to 50% of born-again Christians don't believe in a personal devil at all. I heard that just the other day on the radio, and I, I have to tell you, I'm driving along, and I hear this quote, and I'm thinking to myself, 40-plus percent of born-again men and women don't believe in a personal devil. Okay, let me, try to, let me try to logically think this through. How many times, I'm going to give you this later on in the study, how many times is the devil mentioned in the Scriptures? both the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures. How many times did Jesus himself confront Satan or demon spirits? How many times throughout the epistles, the Pauline epistles and so forth, do we see references to darkness? So if we have 40 to 50% of Christians, born again, by the way, it said, born again men and women don't believe in the devil. If they don't believe in the devil, what do you believe in? Is the Bible true or is it not? Is it the Word of God or is it not? Is it just uh, men who wrote certain things down that we can take it or leave it? I, I wouldn't bet my eternal security on that. If it's in the book, I believe it. I mean, I just have to. There's no other way around it. And, and I think that's for most of us. If it's in the book, we believe it. So I start all that by, by just the preference is or, or the uh, preface is, um, we need to understand as believers, we face a very real enemy. This is not a game. It's not a joke. It's not th something we should ever take lightly. It is something that is very real, very powerful, very malignant. And we better understand who we're dealing with just like Jesus did and confront him in the same way Jesus did because you and I can't fight him on our own. You don't have the strength and I don't have the strength. So if you have your books, turn to page 19, and on page 19, you will see under letter A, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. In the Hebrew, Jesus, the Savior, the Christ. Christ is Greek, of course, for Christos. It means the same thing, Savior, Messiah. And then it says this, invincible Lord. I want you to think about that word as we get started tonight. Invincible Lord. The word invincible can also be translated as unconquerable. Now, I'm going to give you some words here that, that go with this word invincible. He is unconquerable, period. You can't conquer him. He is sovereign. He is Lord. He has all power, all authority, and heaven and earth has been given to him. He is unconquerable. He is unbeatable. These ought to be raising some faith level in you right now because you belong to him and you are in him. He is unbeatable. He is impregnable. You can't violate him. He is unshakable. You know, the scripture talks about in the last time, all those things that can be shaken will be shaken, and only that which can't be shaken will remain. Jesus is the only unshakable force, in my opinion, in the universe, and those who are standing with him and in him. When one understands the immensity of our God, let your, you, you'll never be able to grasp this as I can't, because God is Bigger, higher, greater, uh, far beyond what we can imagine or think. But he is so immense. He is so big. He breathes and power is released. He speaks and worlds are created. A touch from him can heal instantly the most damaged and broken bodies. And his will cannot be violated or altered. 
That is the God that you and I are in today. And when we face the battles of life, listen, I, I, I never, ever mean to diminish what people walk through, ever. That's never my intention. Now, I've been accused of doing that a lot, and I'll probably be accused of it in the future as well. But it's never my intention to diminish the problems of people because I know they're real in all of our lives. We all have issues we deal with. But I want you to know something. You've got to take a step above what you're walking through and look to the one who holds you in the hollow of his hand. You've got to rise to a new place. I mean, the day of Christians whimpering and whining and I can't take this anymore, I can't wait to get to heaven. Listen, if Jesus wanted you in heaven, you'd be in heaven. In fact, in John 17, in that great high priestly prayer, one of my favorite portions of all the Bible, John 17, I love that. It's Jesus pouring out his heart to the Father. And in that, he clearly states, Father, I pray not that you will take them out of this world, but that you will keep them. Let that just kind of bounce around in there for a while. He doesn't want you out of this world. He doesn't want me out of this world. When he does, we'll go. We'll go. It's time to go. But until then, I pray that you will keep them by your power. My. It is important, ladies and gentlemen, to understand our enemy. No doubt about it. We need to know he is real. We need to know who he is, where he came from, what his tactics are. The more you know about him is great. But I certainly want to know more about Jesus than I do the devil. A lot more. The, you know, there's an old thing. I don't know if they do this anymore. Dr. Walter Martin used to talk about how a uh, bank teller would learn to tell the difference between the real and the counterfeit. And what they would do is they send their tellers to wherever, um, wherever they printed money, with Pennsylvania or, or Denver or some, one of the other different places where money is just rolling all the time. Right now, it's probably Washington, D.C. That's a different story. Um, and all a bank teller would do was literally, they would just handle money for a solid week, Monday through Friday, eight hours a day. They'd feel real money. And he said the first time a counterfeit bill slipped between their fingers, they identified it immediately. They didn't have to learn anything about ink color and, and how it's made and all these other things. They just could feel it. And that's where the church needs to go. I don't need to know everything about everything, but I really need to know everything I can about Jesus. And any counterfeit that comes into my life or your life, we're going to recognize it immediately. So we need to understand our enemy before we engage in battle, but it is far more important to know our commander-in-chief. We must know who we are fighting for. Our American soldiers know what they're fighting for. They know uh, that they are the most well-equipped army in the world. They're the most well-trained, most technologically advanced fighting machine on the planet. And nothing could be more encouraging to an American GI than to know that they have the, the weight of the American people behind them and all the technology and, and ammunition and guns and all the things that we have, all the, the aircraft and aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines that nobody ever talks about lurking beneath the waters. It's so encouraging to know what is behind you. And it makes you fight in a different way, doesn't it? That's how the Christian ought to respond. It's good to know that standing with us is the Lord himself, our commander-in-chief. Uh, I was talking to Rabbi John Hausman earlier tonight, and he mentioned, I, he said, what are you studying right now? And I kind of told him the gist of the good fight of faith and, and what we're studying. And tonight we'll be talking about the devil and about our Savior, of course. And he said, boy, wouldn't it be great if General Jerry Boykin could address you on that issue. Now, General Jerry, and I think you've met him before, Pastor, and he is a three-star general. He's actually stayed in our home, Kathy's in my home here in Dandridge, and he's been a friend for some years now. Um, you talk about a man that knows warfare, who has been through something like five wars in his life, who has led men, who was a part of the whole Black Hawk Down thing and, and rescuing those downed airmen. And his knowledge is vast and it's incredible. And, and when Jerry Boykin goes into a battle situation, he goes in with a knowledge in his mind 
of, of strategy and how they're going to take this and how they're going to do this. It's all done. Most Christians today, and this isn't meant to be a knock or a down, but it's meant to be as a fact. Most Christians today do not know the battle we're in. They not only don't know our enemy very well, they don't even know, most of them, how much we have through Jesus. All they know is what they might get once in a while on a radio or a Sunday morning service, and they don't really know who they are. Spiritual warfare is no different than regular warfare in this world. The kingdom of heaven is waging war against the kingdoms of darkness under the direction and the lordship of our commander-in-chief, King Jesus. And this king and kingdom has never known defeat. And by the way, it never will. It never will. Armies that are truly disciplined seldom taste anything but victory. Armies, listen to it again, that are truly disciplined. I know we have several vets in here. You guys have gone through boot camp. You've gone through your military training. You've been a part of the military for some years. Um, it's not always easy, the training. It's not always fun by no stretch of the imagination. It can be hard. It can be harsh. It can be difficult. Uh, there were times I me remember during my training, I was trained like the end of Vietnam, so I did my normal boot camp, and then we had several weeks of training beyond that with the Marine Corps uh, and, and just getting ready for military action. I remember being trained on 3.5 rocket launchers, 81 millimeter mortars, uh, M60 machine guns. We all had M16s, of course. And all the other things that you have to do, and all the cold weather training, and the, and the Mojave Desert, the warm weather training, and on and on. And, and you're, you're just, you're constantly being disciplined for one reason only, and that is to win. There's no other reason. The training is ongoing. It's always the same, to prepare you for the battle. Ladies and gentlemen, these classes and, and Sunday messages and fellowshipping together all are a part of our training in this warfare of the soul. Now, let's get into this a little bit deeper. We're admonished in Hebrews 12, 2. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on on Jesus. There it is up there on the screen. Let me just read it. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Highlight that with a yellow pen you've got on your table. Put that on your refrigerator. Put that in your wallet. Put that wherever you need to put it to remember it. There's a battle out there, and we've got to keep our eyes in the right place. There's a great example, and it's in your book as well, the battle with uh, King Jehoshaphat, who prayed this prayer. Now listen, this is a legitimate battle. This is a king. These are Israelis that are going into battle. They're fighting an enemy. And the king says, Jehoshaphat says, Oh God, we have no might against this great army that is coming against us. And we could pray the same prayer. Neither do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Second Chronicles 20, verse 12. I love the, uh, the simplicity, the honesty, the integrity in that verse. There's times where all of us feel, I don't know what to do. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's next. I don't feel capable. I don't, I don't think I can do this. But keep your eyes focused on him, and he will take you through. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Now, this is very interesting. I want you, it's in your book, and I want you to look at the progression of these uh, phrases. Every one of these phrases I'm about to read to you literally are military terms right here in your New Testament. It says, Jesus came to bring a sword. He also, in Ephesians 4, it says, he took captives. He also led in a triumphal procession, all military phrases. I remember some years ago walking in Red Square in Moscow. It's very cold. I don't remember what month we were there, but I think the temperature was something like 30 below zero. 
and it was probably the coldest I remember in a long, long time. And I stood there in Red Square. I could see St. Basil's Church, that scene that most of you would remember. If you see Moscow, that's the big Russian Orthodox church you see in the back. I was standing there looking at St. Basil's, and, and Red Square is a very large, large area where they used to have the May Day Parade, it was called, if I remember right, where Brezhnev and all the Russian leaders would have their military processions go by. And it was kind of a, uh, you know, it was, it was just a, a rah-rah thing for the, for the Russian people and so forth. But it was a triumphal procession. And it, it spoke of our might and our, our military power and all that. Well, we're told in Colossians that Jesus also led in a triumphal procession. All military terms to help us see that we live in a state of battle until the final battle is won and ultimate peace reigns forever. May I say to you tonight, and this is not going to sound uh, nice or comfortable, but the battle is going to go on in your life and mine until we go home to be with him. It's not going to stop. I, I wish I could say, you know, tomorrow at 12 noon, the devil's going to sign a, a, an agreement and he's going to put his, you know, his armies to rest and we're not going to fight the enemy anymore. Not going to happen. It's only going to happen when he is put away by the power of God for a thousand years and then we live and reign in a sense of peace and unity and so forth. And then he's going to be released again. And he brings the, you know, he rallies this big army against Christ and his followers. And that's it. God puts it all down and it's done. And then judgment and so forth. There is going to be battle until Jesus takes it all away. So, what is our place of victory? Look at letter B on page 20, the cross. The truth is, what happened on the cross is our victory, not the cross itself. The cross is a very cruel symbol of Roman torture and so forth. And, and I'm not demeaning the cross. Don't misunderstand. I'm just saying it's not just a symbol. It's what Jesus did on that cross that is our victory. What happened on the cross is giving us victory. The atoning death, his redemptive work. The ultimate defeat of the enemy, all accomplished by Jesus on a cruel Roman cross. I, I tell people often, you know, it's not so much that a man died on a cross. I've had actually um, people say that to me. Well, what's the big deal? The Romans crucified a lot of people. Yeah, they did. They absolutely did. The big deal is who was on the cross. We're not talking just a man. We're talking God. We're talking God. And, and let that just, you know, let that just, medi just meditate on that for a few centuries, if you will. When I think of creator God making man from the dust of the earth, Adam, Adam, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life and man becomes a living being or soul. When I think of a God who is so powerful and passionate and loving and can do anything he wants other than violate his own will, of course. Dying for us? Um, I'll never understand that while I live. Never, never, never. I can tell you honestly, I wouldn't do it for you. <laughs> and I doubt if you would do it for me. I mean, there are people who would give their lives for someone else. Don't misunderstand me. But God giving up his life, taking the form of a man, humbling himself, leaving an aspect, I believe he was fully God and fully man when he walked the earth, but leaving an aspect of his divinity behind. There were certain things he didn't know when he was here on the earth. That was by choice. He did that on purpose. Who touched me? What do you mean who touched you? There's people all around you. But he recognized a touch, didn't he? And that woman was healed and so forth. When you realize who was on the cross and what he was doing, how, this is, this is almost earth shattering, but how in the world does someone taste of death who should have never, ever, ever experienced anything close to that? He never sinned. He knew no sin. No sin was in him. And yet he tasted death. 
he should have never tasted that because the wages of sin is death. And yet he chose to die as a perfect sacrifice. And those of you that know the Hebrew Scriptures, you know the lamb, how it was brought and examined and, and then uh, put to death, and the blood of atonement was placed on the horns of the altar, and then once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take it into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, place it on the mercy seat. And we see in that beautiful, beautiful picture of Hebrew history how the Lamb of God, we believe Jesus, the Lamb of God, examined by Pilate, put to death for the sins of mankind. Blood put on the mercy seat in heaven, we're told in the book of Hebrews. Should have never tasted that. When you get a picture of the realization of that and the power of that act of love, all of a sudden it elevates you and I to a new level that we've never been at. Now we know why we can do all things through him who strengthens us. When you realize what he's done, when you realize what is at your disposal and my disposal, all accomplished by Jesus on a cruel Roman cross. Revelation 1.5, he is called the first begotten from the dead. Now that doesn't mean that he was the first one to be resurrected. No. He raised Lazarus from the dead before he even died. People in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, were raised to life and so forth. We see that. Remember the, the, the fellow that was put down on the bones of Elisha? And he sprang to life. But what it does mean, the first begotten of the dead, he is the first to die, never to die again. Anyone who died before him, including Lazarus, raised from the dead, had to die again. But Jesus was the first begotten from the dead, never to die. Ah, oh, he reconciled us to God, having made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1.20. Again, don't let any of these verses, we hear them all the time. He, Christ, reconciled us to God through the blood of his cross. He put us in right standing with God. He gave us a position that we never had before, that we can go to him directly. The veil in the temple torn in two. We have direct access, it says, to God the Father. Hebrews 2.14. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now we're going to get into some good stuff here. The word translated destroyed can be better translated as to render inoperative. To render inoperative. It doesn't mean he destroyed him in the sense that he doesn't exist anymore. He does. It doesn't mean he destroyed him and he doesn't have any power anymore. He still has power. He still is a very malignant being who is wreaking havoc on this world, and he loves doing it. He's come for what reasons? To kill, steal, and destroy. That's what the Lord himself said about Satan. He comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. But his power now would be rendered inoperative in our lives. Think of that, if you will. The only way I can, can really explain that, let's say, anybody, anybody here ever hear of an Abrams A1? That is our great tank that we use in the military. It's an Abrams A1. It's a very powerful fighting tank. Uh, capabilities beyond what I can even explain here tonight. It's a powerful piece of equipment. If that piece of equipment was left in a foreign land, but we destroyed the workings of it, you've got sitting in front of you a gigantic piece of military equipment that is inoperative. It will do you no good because we've destroyed it. Still there, still impressive, but it won't work for you. That's how you need to look at the enemy. He is an impressive foe, but he is considered inoperative in our lives because you have overcome him already through the blood of the cross. Think of that. Let it sink in. All right. And, of course, you know 1 John 4, 4 very well. You've quoted it. You probably know it by heart. Greater is he. And the emphasis is on he. 
the Lord. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So, that kind of sums up just briefly and quickly our source, our place of victory. It's not in us. It's not in our skills and abilities. and It's not in the amount of knowledge I can grasp. This is not a mental thing. It's not in my strength physically. No matter how strong you are, it doesn't matter. Our place of authority and power and strength comes from the Lord, and that's where we need to keep our eyes focused on him in every battle that we have. Now let's move into point number two, page 21 under letter A, Satan. Let's talk about him. We're not going to give him too much recognition tonight, but I think we do need to give him an honest evaluation. He is our enemy. And I'm not sure if that's in the book there, enemy, but if it is, please highlight it. He is your enemy. He is your enemy. You've heard Pastor Philip how many times? Hundreds? Say people are not your enemy. And he's right. As difficult as, as people can be, oh my goodness, they can be difficult. They're not our enemy. They're just not. Learn who your enemy is. And by the way, if, if, and I don't think I've mastered this one yet either, so don't feel bad. If we can somehow connect with the reality of who my enemy really is, then every time anybody does anything that I really don't like at all, I will hopefully make that connection immediately. That's not them. They're being used, but the enemy is the devil. He is my enemy. And, and we need to go back to that. We have to go back to that. The devil is our enemy. Take your enemy seriously, I might add. He's not a joke. As I said earlier, he does not wear a red union suit and brandish a pitchfork. He is not just a Halloween night kind of depiction of the devil. He is real. Many deny his character and excuse him as nothing more than the bad that exists in humanity. You've heard that and I've heard that. Uh, people do some pretty nasty stuff. There's no doubt about it. People can be bad. I mean, the Bible very clearly says we're all sinners, come short of the glory of God, none righteous, no, not one. That's both in the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures. We need to understand that we are born into sin. Isn't that what the prophet said? We are born. Uh, one translation says it. You are born with a twisted and perverted nature. Boy, that just doesn't sound good, does it? It really doesn't. But it's true. We're born because of the fall of Adam and Eve. And that has been passed on to all generations of humankind right to this moment. Now, there is forgiveness. Don't misunderstand. But it doesn't mean that that original sin, we don't hear those terms too much anymore. The original sin, every human being is born with it. And, and, ladies and gentlemen, this is a true statement. No matter how bad people can be, we're not more than a step behind. Any human being is capable of the most horrendous, awful, destructive, disgusting things that you can imagine. Anybody. Stay close to God. He's the only place we can go where we can get help. So, we're dealing with a very real being, someone who is after you and I, and I said this uh, a few weeks ago, and somebody came up to me recently and just said, I've never looked at it that way. Satan hates God. You, you know his story. You know his rebellion from Ezekiel 28, his fall from grace. He was cast out of heaven with one-third of the angels that rebelled with him. He, his his uh, place of domain, if you will, was planet Earth. I wish... God sent him to Mars or something, or even further, but he's planet Earth. And, um, and there's reasons for that. We don't have time to go into all that theologically, but there's reasons for it. Anyway, um, he is mentioned, I think this is in your book as well, Genesis, First Chronicles, Job, Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, all mention Satan. And he is very much mentioned in the New Testament. Every writer in the New Testament mentions him, every single one of them. The Gospels mention him 48 times. 
which should make it very clear if you believe the Bible. I started this teaching tonight with telling you what I just recently heard, that a, a fairly large percentage of born-again Christians don't even believe in the devil anymore. How can you believe anything else in the Bible? If you don't believe that, what else couldn't be real then? If, if Satan isn't real and Jesus confronted him, the Bible talks about him, then what else isn't real? So we really need to make up our minds. Either if we are Bible-believing Christians, and I, th I would say all of us in this room are, then we need to take the word for face value. Would you agree with that? We need, if it says it, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of these types, I never, ever, ever like bumper stickers, not even Christian ones. I've, <laughs> I've never had one on a car except my very first car. I had a Chevy van, went out and bought it, brand new, I don't remember the year. It had to be like a 1977, somewhere around there, Chevy van. And I put one bumper sticker on it, and it just simply, I'll never forget it. It just said this, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And I just proudly wore that for like four years until I traded that in, never put a bumper sticker on again. Um, but if we're Bible believers, you've got to believe the word. There's no other foundation. There's no, yeah, all of it. That's right, CM. Where else can we go? If, if I'm struggling with something in the scriptures, then that's something I need to work through. Not that I don't believe it. Lord, help me understand it. Help me put it in its proper historical context. Help me understand it in the light of, of everything else that's going on here, in the, in the culture of the Hebrews or in this or in that. But just because I don't understand it doesn't mean I shouldn't believe it. If it's in the book, it's in the book for a reason. And I tell you, Christians, if we really took our Bibles more seriously, we might take some of the things we're talking about a little more seriously, too. We need to get back to the book. I, I love it. The, uh, the Jewish people are known as people of the book. People of the book. I love that. And I think Christians, Pastor, ought to be known as people of the book. And I think we are. We are. We believe the scriptures. So with all those references, 48 times in the gospels he's mentioned, we need to believe it. It is clear from the Bible itself that the role of the enemy is adversarial. I think that word is in your book. Highlight that. Put that in yellow. Adversarial. What does it mean? Well, it's his name. Satan means adversary. Accuser of the brethren. I think of Job, and I, I, I love the book of Job. I'm not sure if I fully understand all of it, but you know, um, I, I certainly didn't like it when it says Satan appeared before God and said, hey, how about your servant Job? Pretty righteous guy down there, isn't he? Yeah. Well, if you just do this, God, and take this away, or not shield him, or not protect him, or not do this, he'll curse you. And God had enough confidence in Job and says, really? Let's give it a shot. And, of course, we know the end from the beginning. The end of Job with all that he walked through. And I know some people say, I, I've actually heard Christian leaders say, we don't believe this is a true story. We believe it's an allegory um, based on what could happen and so forth. And I thought, why would you even say that? I don't think there's an allegory in the Bible that puts a man's name on the man. In fact, I, I remember studying some years ago in theology that even in the parables, a parable can be pretty much, you can tell it's a parable by the fact that there's no names in it. It was a story that was given to prove something and so on. Job wasn't a parable. It wasn't an allegory. I believe he existed. I believe his wife really told him, curse God and die. And he said, no, not going to do it. Naked I came into the world, naked I'm going out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Think of that, the adversary, and he's still walking around. Apollon means destroyer. That's another name for the devil. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Apollon means destroyer. He is called the god of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. That's little g, by the way, the god of this world. And he is also called the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. 2. 
We're going to take some of these now and go into them just a bit. We don't have a whole lot of time, but I, I really want to talk about the domain of darkness, the, the, the realm in which he operates and so forth, and help us, hopefully, uh, to realize who this adversary is. He is the enemy of not just Christians. Please hear this. He is the enemy of all humanity. All humanity. If he can kill you before you come to faith, he's happy. He is a destroyer. His purpose is one of opposition, accusation, seduction, deception, and destruction. He's a real foe, my friend, and he has a demonic hierarchy. When you talk about the devil or demons today, people really think you're either a Jesus freak or you're just some weirdo goofball that just doesn't understand anything at all. They just think you're off, you know, off the rails somehow. But Ephesians 6.12, and most of us know this very well, says that we are wrestling against principalities against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let's talk about principalities just for a moment. We're not going to spend very much time on any of these. A principality, and I believe some of this is in your book, maybe not all of it, seems to be a territorial or regional spiritual dimension. Now remember, he is called the prince of the power of the air. There are some, and I, again, I don't know if this is 100% correct, but I'm just going to give you my summation of this. Um, it is believed by most scholars that, that darkness, Satan, demons, inhabit a sphere. It is other dimensional. It's not of our dimension. We don't see them, although I believe they can manifest just like angels can manifest in our dimension. So there are other dimensional beings, but they are around us, and we don't know how far or where their domain is, but, but we generally tend to think they just they surround, if you will, the earth and the atmosphere. And again, I don't think we're talking outer space. I just think we're talking in a sphere that we can't see. So he, there's territorial demons that are over certain regions and so forth. I remember Congresswoman Michelle Bachman and I were talking a few years ago. We were up in Boston, and she said, you know, Joe, she said, every time a man or a woman comes to Washington, and some of them are, are so, so good, they're, they're strong believers, some of them, and they go, they get elected to a, a congressional seat or a senatorial seat, and and they're going to Washington, and they're going to change the world like we all want to change the world. And she said, but every single time they get there, something happens. And she starts unpacking this, this understanding, now you and I would understand it, of how this darkness just invades everything. And you kind of go there with the best intentions, and it doesn't take too much time where you're sidetracked. You're not a bad person. You still love God, but you're sidetracked. That, ladies and gentlemen, could be a principality, something that they're dealing with in a region or a place or a nation or whatever where, where there is this invasion of darkness that blinds us to the realities of the truth. And then we're, taught, we're told there are powers that are present. And they seem to be spirits that blanket an area with particular energy, if you will, to influence for evil. And I look at that, and again, some of this is conjecture. Please take it with a grain of salt. It's like eating fish. Eat the meat, spit out the bones. Um, I'm just giving you some thoughts after X amount of years, 45 years walking with the Lord, and things you see and learn. Um, so they're just, some of these are my thoughts. But when I, when I see powers, evil spirits that blanket certain areas with particular evil influence, I think of things like Hollywood. I think of spheres of, of, um, uh, of influence. I think, and, and I don't want to get too specific at all, because there's good people in Hollywood, and there's good people in education, and there's good people, there's good people in everything. But there are also darkness, 
that tends to uh, manipulate and shift and cause things to happen and, and take our, our eyes off of what really is important. And, and you know, I, I, think it was, um, I think it was Lauren Cunningham and um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the other gentleman's name. He's passed away now. Uh, Bill Bright, Dr. Bill Bright. Some of you heard this story. I think I've told it a few years back in the fireside room. They, they both had a vision. Now, Lauren Cunningham is a charismatic. Bill Bright was a Baptist. They were both great men. They both had great organizations. Lauren with uh, Youth with a Mission. Bill Bright was Campus Crusade for Christ. Great, great ministries, both of them. They both had a vision on the same day, unknown to each other, and didn't discover it till years later when they were together in an event and started talking to each other, and this came up, and they were blown away. What they saw in this vision that they both had was spheres of influence, and they were specific. It was government. It was education. It was, um, um, oh gosh, uh, what's that? Media, yeah, there, anyway, there were seven different spheres of influence that the Lord said, we have let go of and turned it over to the world. And we shouldn't be so shocked that the world's influence are all over those things now. And, and you and I are now the recipients of turn a television set on. Who turns a TV on like that anymore, huh? <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> I was talking to a pastor in Boston today, and I said, you know, I'm trying to send you something. Give me your email address, and he gave me it. It's his name at AOL.com, and I started laughing. I said, AOL. I said, Eric, you are showing your age, my brother. I said, who has an AOL account anymore? <laughs> so do I. I have one, too. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anyway. These spheres of influence. Now, you and I, if you're like me, I get mad. In fact, yesterday, I had, to, I had to literally walk out of my living room because I was so angry by what I was seeing on the news about what's going on in the Middle East. I, was, I mean, I, I literally, uh, in fact, I said something I wish I had never had said out loud. But I said, it wasn't swearing. Don't, I didn't cuss or anything. Don't, don't get all upset. But I just said something that I should not have said. And I have to remember, and we all have to remember, the spheres of influence that govern our lives now, whether it's education, media, um, uh, government, and on and on and on, we let it go. I remember as a young, young Christian, I, you know, I was taught as a, a baby Christian, no, Hollywood, no. No, you just, that's the devil's playground. Just let that go. And we did. We all let it go. We didn't try to. Thank God there are men and women today that are rising up, raising millions of dollars and putting out quality programming again that is beginning to affect the generations. We've got to take these spheres back. We've got to have them back if we're going to live quiet and peaceable lives. Or we're just going to let the enemy run over it. Powers are demon spirits that influence particular areas. Depression, violence may be examples. People, gosh, how many young people have we heard have taken their lives during the last 18 months with COVID? Uh, do you understand that? I, I mean, I can't, I can't wrap my brain around it. Okay, so I'm locked in my hotel or in my apartment in Manhattan for 18 months. Yeah, that'd be pretty depressing. But I, I, I mean, I'm not going to take my life. But again, we're not wired like everybody's wired. Everybody's different. So we really need to, we've just got to start battling this from a spiritual place. Francis Frangipane is mentioned in your book. I don't know if you know that name. I am not one in my entire life, I do not like novels. I just don't. I, I just can't hardly pick up a novel. Because before I pick it up, I know it's not real. So I don't want to read it. I've only read like biographies and and I mean, I'll do study guides and stuff, but not novels. Francis Frangipane is the only guy, I think, in my life that I can tell you, I not only read his novels, I love them. If you've never read This Present Darkness, I, I, I don't even know if you can get it anymore. It is so, so good. 
and goes into what we're talking about right now in, in different layers. It is just powerful stuff. Extremely good. We need to know where we stand. And we've got to hurry now. We're almost done. And then, of course, the last one is the rulers of the darkness of this world. Appears to be demonic influences that exert darkness on a national scale. And we don't want to spend a lot of time on that right now because there's just too many things going on that will get too personal, I think. But the devil does influence on a national scale. He does influence governments. All you have to do is look at Nazi Germany. All you have to look, look at the, the great empires of this world and what took place. Children being sacrificed and, and just on and on and on. Darkness, darkness, darkness. And there's one more which I don't even know how to comment on. Spiritual wickedness in high places may just be another class of spirits exercising authority in the heavens. I, I want to close by going back to a scripture that I've preached on several times in my life and I love. And it's the one where Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. And when they came back, you all know this. I've even talked about it here. When they came back, they were rejoicing that the devils were subject unto them through his name through the authority of Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus said, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So he, he kind of refocused their priority. You know, that's not it. That's good that that happened. Wonderful. But rejoice that your name's written in heaven. So point them back toward heaven again. But in that, this is fascinating. If you, if you really look at that particular portion of Scripture, you will see this. Jesus said, I saw Satan like lightning fall from heaven. I've always interpreted that as the, as the expulsion of Lucifer out of heaven. But I'm reminded by scholars that he's not referring to the expulsion of Lucifer that they can see because he's speaking in the Greek present tense and says, while you were going out in my authority, preaching the gospel, I saw the domain of darkness fall. That gives me chills every time I say it. You and I don't see it because it's other dimensional. But inside of you is the power of God. Inside of you is the authority of heaven. Inside of you is God wanting to do more than you and I even want him to do, but he's waiting to get out if we will just go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in that his house will be filled. I believe we will see the power of God restored again. Many right now are believing in this moment that real revival is coming again. In fact, as it gets darker and uglier out there, the church ought to lift up its head and realize our redemption is drawing near. Salvation is coming to multitudes. It's already started. It's going to get greater. But you and I are the light. Can I say the light of the world? Sure. That's right out of the Hebrew Scriptures. And Jesus told it to his, his own Jewish people. You are the light of the earth. A city set on a hillside cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put a bushel basket over it. But they put it on a candlestick and it gives light to all that are in the house. You're the salt of the earth. What you and I possess through the cross of Jesus, you could not even put into English words. There, that's why I think we have a prayer language sometimes, because God just gave us the goods. We have everything we need. It is time to rise up and do battle and be the victor through the true victor, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Pastor, come and close this out if you would. Amen. Wow, what a powerful message tonight. Thank you so much, Brother Joe. We appreciate you so much. Let's tell Brother Joe one more time how much we appreciate him. Amen. And let's thank God for this message tonight, for this word. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let me just remind you, like Brother Joe just said, that we are the light of the world. So, are you lit tonight? And I'm not meaning that in the worldly way. 
but I'm reminded of the little song, the kid's song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Come on, hold it up. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So we need to be burning brightly in this hour. We need to be set on fire with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be set on fire with the fire that filled Jesus while he was here on the earth and is still uh, inhabiting him and filling him now at the right hand of the Father. We need to be burning brightly in this hour. We need to be clothed in the whole armor of God. And just like Brother Joe said, we need to be moving and advancing in the power of Jesus Christ against the darkness by his power and by his authority. Amen. So let's close in prayer this, night, this evening. Father, we just thank you for the truth of your word. And Father, so many times we don't feel like it. We, don't, we, we just don't feel like it, Lord. But Father, it's more than just feeling. It's the reality of the word of God. Father, it's, it's faith. And Father, so even when we don't feel like it, Father, many times that's exactly when God is wanting to use us. So, Father, help us to yield to you. Help us to say yes to you. Help us to stand up even if we don't feel like standing up, but allow the power of God to raise us up in this hour and in this moment. And help us, Lord, to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can advance by your power against the kingdom of darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. I love you. Shalom.